Joining me today is the Athletics Leeds correspondent, Nancy Frost, and as well as our Tottenham writer, Jay Harris, as well. Jay, let, let's start with you on this one. This deal, wow, reading about it, seems like a manic 48 hours in which Brentford looked like they were going to get their man then last minute. Here comes Spurs swooping in on the target. Tell us a little bit more about how this transfer transpired. I'm also just uh, reacting to the fact, I think this is the first time I've been called the Tottenham correspondent on a podcast. Now that <laughs> We I've forgot to my... tell you about, yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah, forgot yeah, yeah. to now mention that, that you've moved from Brentford, right? Here you are uh, talking yeah, yeah, yeah. Tottenham. And, and the first time I, I make an appearance to talk about Tottenham, it's Brentford related <laughs> as well. Yeah, what a crazy 48 hours it was over the weekend. Um, I'm sure, like many people, they were just concentrating on England's last 16 game. And then um, this ended up being nearly matching the level of drama that was on in that game. So um, basically on Saturday afternoon, looked like Brentford had pulled ahead in this deal. Um, Gray went to Brentford's training ground. He completed a medical. The um, signs were that everything was pushing towards what would have been a club record fee for Brentford um, on an 18-year-old midfielder with a lot of talent, but that's a really significant level of investment from Brentford. Mm -hmm. And then everybody woke up on Sunday morning and he'd um, changed his mind and decided to go to Tottenham. And I think... The key, a couple of the key factors behind this deal are that Johan Langer and Rob McKenzie, who are Tottenham's technical director and chief scout, they've made a real play over the last 12 months or so of trying to change the way Tottenham recruit players. And we'll dig into the specifics of that a little bit later. But I've made it very clear that they really want to be a home for some of the best young talent in the world. You know, in the January window, they signed Lucas Bergbull, who's 18. They signed Radu Jagusin, who was 21 at the time. They're just really trying to cherry pick the best young players who can forge part of Ange Postecoglou's squad for the next five, 10 years in the best case scenario. Um, Gray ticks a lot of boxes. I think he played 44 times in the championship last season. And I think he only turned 18 in March, April. So to have that level of experience at that young an age, one shows that you must be incredibly talented, but also is a real testament to your mentality. Um, he can play right back as well. So there's a level of versatility there. So I think it wasn't just Tottenham and Brentford that were in for him this summer. I think Aston Villa were interested as well. I think there was rumblings of Borussia Dortmund. But Tottenham and Brentford were the two clubs who got the um, closest to signing him. And then in the end, he's just decided to go with a team who, you know, Tottenham finished fifth last season. They can offer him the Europa League football. Whereas Brentford finished 16th last season. Maybe there's a feeling of Tottenham will be a bigger step up. Um, but then I guess there's a question about how many minutes he'll get. Um, but yeah, that's the... In a nutshell, a mad 48 hours. Well, how did they convince him to go to Tottenham and actually last minute ditch Brentford? Because, I mean, you can expect him going to Brentford and, and getting quite a few minutes there. Yeah, of course. Um, and I think it is important to say that he was really impressed by the um, presentations that Brentford gave to him. It's not the first time I've heard that Brentford are very far or very detailed when they're um, talking to potential new signings. I think this pitch was led by, by Thomas Frank and Lee Dykes. But like I said, I think it comes down to Tottenham are just that further along in their development. They are a bigger club in terms of the global reach, in terms of the expectations, in terms of where they are in the league. Um, I'm sure Gray is looking around thinking, OK, well, as I've already mentioned, there's a lot of other young players here who've been given an opportunity. I can really grow with this team and, and win trophies. Um, in his interview he did with the club, he mentioned about playing in the Champions League in the future. That's more likely to happen at Tottenham than it is Brentford. So I think the quality of Brentford's pitch by Thomas Frank Lee Dykes was what made him waver and for a few hours made it look like he was going to go to Brentford. And then he's just woken up and said, actually, do you know what? Tottenham's the, the better challenge for me right now. And then I think, I'm sure Nancy can explain it a little bit more. There's also the optics of what him leaving Leeds to join Brentford would have looked like. Um, there's a bit of a faux rivalry that's existed between the teams in the last few years. And certainly on social media, when it looked like on Saturday night, he was going to Brentford. I think Leeds fans and Brentford fans were just absolutely exploding at each other. One of my good friends is a Leeds fan and he certainly wasn't particularly happy with me when he saw me on Sunday um, at the prospect he was going to go to Brentford. Um, and I think just to give people a little bit of background context, this all kind of started about four years ago when Brentford and Leeds were both trying to get promoted from the championship together. Thomas Frank made some comments and it was perceived as um, trying to play mind games towards Bielsa and his team. Didn't go down particularly well. And then after Leeds got promoted, I think it was Stuart Dallas and Liam Cooper were filmed singing Mind the Gap, Thomas Frank, Mind the Gap. So ever since then, 
there's been a little bit of tension. Um, you know, Leeds nearly got relegated at Brentford on the last day of the 2021-22 season. And then I think it might have been Jack Harrison scored a last minute goal. Rafinha did this really weird celebration at full time where he crawled across the length of Brentford's pitch towards the Brentford fans. So there's been loads of these little moments. And so I think from Leeds fans' perspective, the idea that he was going to go to Brentford was just, yeah, didn't go down well. Yeah, it's not the first time we've heard this, Jay. Players coming to Tottenham because of Ange. What, what is the allure here? What's going on? I think the um, end of last season kind of um, made people forget just how strongly Tottenham started under Ange Pox, the Coglu. You know, this time last year, the club were not in a good position. You know, they'd been burnt by what happened with Conte, with Mourinho, um, with Nuno. And so they were looking for somebody to just really reinvigorate. And most importantly, he did it playing a very attractive, brave style of football. And look, there's still an endless debate about how high their line is. But the most important thing is players want to go there. Players want to feel like they can play in a team that's going to dominate the ball. They're going to have lots of chances. And so Gray will be looking at that thinking, if I play for this team and I get to go in my preferred position of midfield, I'm going to get on the ball. I'm going to be playing alongside James Madison. I'm going to be playing alongside Hung Min Son. That's going to be a really attractive prospect for any young player. And then also, as we said, this is a very young team. They can grow together for the next five, ten years. And so I think that's a very exciting thing. And Postacoglu's had a lot of success where he's gone. He's, you know, was absolutely phenomenal at Celtic, won loads of trophies. He's done it before in other places. So you're looking at him as a manager saying he clearly gets the best out of players. He's clearly a very good, very good communicator and a very good coach. He's going to be a really positive influence on my career. Mm, Nancy, I'm just sitting here thinking, young lad. Leeds lad as well, family ties to Leeds. There's an emotional thing here. Will Leeds be sad to see such a great prospect and an academy, academy graduate go on to the Premier League so soon? Yeah, I mean, this is massively emotional for everyone, you know, for the family, for the club, for the fans. Um, we're talking about a third generation Leeds player here. You know, his um, his dad played for Leeds, his granddad played for Leeds, his uh, great uncle Eddie is, you know, has been involved in some capacity at the club since 1965. So everything about uh, the Gray family and Leeds is intertwined. His younger brother's in the academy and, you know, well thought of as well. So, um Ideally, I think he's a player that Leeds would have, you know, would have built their future around. He's he's the jewel in the crown, right? But PSR is a factor here for Leeds. Um, it it kind of came down to the the deadline, and we've seen all the bonkers moves all over the the Premier League for those clubs in that position. So they're not going to have wanted to have done this, and I think in their official statement they kind of put in the fact that that they were gutted to see him go or heartbroken, I think was the the actual phrase. Um, and that that's probably true for, for Archie leaving. It, it's the way that this is all played out for an 18 year old to have gone through all of this. Like it's such a lot of pressure. It's, it's such a big decision to have made. But um, as Jay touched on, I think the optics of going to Spurs versus Brentford as well makes it a little easier on Leeds fans had he gone to Brentford that's that's just not seen as a as a step up if you're you know if you're a Leeds fan um so yeah it it's very emotional still I think it'll take a while for Leeds fans in particular um to kind of process and and be okay with because he he's the dream he's you know apart from the talent um the homegrown element the the way he's burst onto the scene, it's its all been a bit of a fairy tale. So, Yeah, I mean, you, you get a sense that a young lad like that with those connections would have wanted to stay at Leeds. Um, so, you know, we spoke about PSR slightly there. Was that the main reason? I mean, just how bad are the finances of Leeds at the moment? Because this is a club that's gone through a lot of financial issues historically, as many football fans will know. Yeah, I mean... Like the, the main point to say is, as a whole, the picture is fine, is good mm. um, under the 49ers. But obviously, there was just this problem of the the three year rolling PSR period, which is you know the same issue for some of the other Premier League clubs. But the the Championship loss allowance is is obviously less than than a Premier League club. Um, we didn't know the exact figure, and and Leeds have had some investment from Red Bull uh, via their sponsorship um, this summer, which has really helped with that. But 
I think, you know, it's safe to say that they're now in a much healthier position with PSR and and they're probably in a position where if they sell any more players this year, it will be because they feel that's a good deal for them rather than the pressure of of having to sort of make up that shortfall with um, PSR losses. So I think it's definitely a factor. I think, I think, you know, Archie would have been very happy to stay at Leeds, but equally there's that that opportunity there and there was that release clause in his contract, which um, I guess you don't put that in there unless <laughs> unless at some point there's some consideration that, you know, he might have had had a move there. But um, primarily, yeah, it, it's, you know, it's a good deal for Leeds. But talking in those terms about an 18 year old who's <laughs> such a, you know, um, a prized asset in terms of the emotional f- factors of fans is it's just a really weird juxtaposition I suppose that's just the way that modern football is your you know your brightest academy talent for years is is it a bargaining chip that you you probably have to cash in just to ensure you're not in bother further down the line with points deductions and all sorts so um yeah it's helped them but yeah at a, at a cost emotionally I think yeah for sure I mean we spoke about Newcastle yesterday similar situation having to sell homegrown players in that respect um you touched on it there Nancy you know in terms of potential players leaving uh, I mean it was probably last year or last season when Nyoto handed in a transfer request right you look at players like that you know Italy internationals, Premier League experience, Somerville another one. Could we see some of those guys leaving um, as Leeds looked for promotion um, back into the Premier League? Because they they narrowly missed out on it, didn't they, last season? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, you know, as close as as close as you can get, Mm -hmm. right, the playoff final. But um, those sorts of players, they're always going to attract interest, I think. And and, um, I suppose another season of championship, whether (laughs) every single one of them is going to going to fancy that, you don't know. But um, the main thing for Leeds is, I think, for those other players, the interest wasn't at an advanced enough stage Mm -hmm. um, in time for the PSR deadline. Um, But if they, you know, if they do decide to sell them this summer, it will be because it suits them to sell them for what whatever fee they're in a good position they've been in a good position this whole time because they've got mm. multiple assets that are you know really attractive to other clubs so um if it wasn't great it could have been one of the others but i think it was just that that was the most viable one at that time mm. um and, and and they'll still be getting requests and interest in yeah in nonto and and somerville and others um and you know I can I can see a world where where they sell another one of those players if it means that they can do something else that suits them better in in the window, but it's all very measured at Leeds. I don't think this is panic stations at any point. I don't think they're going to go panic buying anyone if they do sell someone um, and they have that bit more in their sort of transfer reserves. So it's all quite strategic, and we've seen them kind of get their ducks in a row early in the window. Um, so it'd be interesting to see what they do with, you know. Putting, putting some money on the table for other players, apart from Joe Rodon, who's obviously come in as part of this. Okay, well, let, let's move on to sort of how we see this young lad playing in the Premier League. Um, it's clearly got the ability, but, you know, there'll be a lot of people listening to this podcast, Nancy, who have not seen him play all season. Um, what, what, are, what are his attributes? You know, what does he offer Leeds that has got so many teams, ears pricks, they think he can make it to the next level? He's a massively exciting player, I um I first saw him in January in the FA Cup against Chelsea and he just looked massively comfortable and and at that level um bearing in mind this is like the first season where he's got a real extended run in the team um he's versatile can play central midfield that's his preferred position um and largely the position he's played coming through the academy but also right back which is where he was used mostly by Daniel Farker um last season I think that's kind of benefited him in, in a way and Farker's managed it really well in terms of, um, you know, introducing him in an area where he's been able to settle into the team and, um, you know, he's only he's still quite slight. I think if he was to go into midfield, maybe he needs a little bit more to bulk up or, yeah, just develop that side. Um, but he's got great close control. He'll take, you know, he's not afraid to carry the ball, take players on. Um, and, and he never really looked out of depth defensively as a right back so even though he would probably prefer to be in central midfield um he d- he did really well there so yeah he's he's just got a lot about him in terms of a maturity in the way he plays um and 
I can see him if he gets enough time. I can see him really just adapting to to that level so easily. Um, but every time he gets on the ball, you kind of think, right, he's going to do something here. And I've seen some of the clips already going round where people have stitched together all the time, just turned a player or, you know, done a little skill to go past someone. So um, he's a real talent. Yeah, I mean, like, there's, I've seen those clips too. There's a real tenacity to, to him from what I see in general. But Jay, um, Nancy spoke about his preferred position there, being in midfield. I mean, a young lad like that, with very little Premier League experience, can't expect to come to Spurs and try and bustle into that really stacked midfield. Do you get a sense of how Spurs might want to use this lad? Because it is still a six-year contract, so it's got time to be built into this team. Yeah, I think that's the slight worry that after a year where he's played so often that he could go to Spurs and maybe not get the amount of minutes that he should do. You look at Tottenham's midfield at the moment, you've got Ibasuma, Pape Matassar, James Madison, Rodrigo Bentancur, You've got Oliver Skip, you know, they've just signed Lucas Bergvall from Jure Garden. I think there's about eight or nine players in there. And that's before you factor into account they really like Conor Gallagher. And we don't know what's mm. going to happen with that interest, but it's long mm. long-term interest. So if they manage to get him as well, the numbers in there are, are significant. Um, but I'm sure Gray will get the opportunity to play maybe in the beginning in the cup competitions, in the Europa League. And then so hopefully slowly we'll start to see him more in the Premier League. And then obviously his versatility is a bonus. Um, Tottenham have had a little bit of an issue at right back when Pedro Porro has not played. I actually think Porro was the um, player who got the second highest amount of minutes for Tottenham last season. So they didn't have to worry too much without him. But when he is not there and they've got to put Emerson Royale in that position, it just doesn't look quite as smooth. And so I think, you know, Nancy's just alluded to it, but Gray's talent on the ball in that position, if Porro is unavailable or Porro needs to be rested, he needs a break, bless him, then Gray can kind of fit into that role and, and do what's needed. Yeah, for sure. Um, something I just want to touch on, Jay, is, uh, you know, this is, you know, a transfer window, which is, I guess, under the new sort of recruitment structure at Spurs. Um, can you just give us a sense of what that looks like now? We've already spoken about two young players that have already come through. Dragosan, I'm sure so many people have seen at the Euro so far, looking very, very good. And with the addition of Gray, what does this structure look like and what are they looking to achieve? The main changes that have happened is that in October, they appointed Johan Langer as their new technical director. He came from Aston Villa. He brought Rob McKenzie with him as their chief scout. And they also brought Frederick Leff, who's in charge of kind of like data and the head of research. And so Tottenham have really shifted towards using data at the core of their um, operations. They've let a lot of their long-serving scouts go. They're hiring new scouts. They're hiring data scientists and data engineers. Um, so the way that they work is very different. I think there's way more checks and balances throughout the process, which is very good because it probably means the chances of you signing a player who doesn't fit your team's style are way more reduced. But then sometimes the madness of the transfer market demands that you act quickly. And sometimes if there are too many checks and balances, that might mean that an opportunity slips away. Um, but yeah, so as I kind of touched on earlier, Langer and McKenzie are in charge now. They very much want to target a lot of young players who can kind of grow and develop. You know, we hear lots of clubs want to do that this way nowadays and concentrate less on um, players who are maybe in the prime of their careers and going to, going to cost way more in terms of transfer fees and wages. Mm -hmm. But you just look at some of the players that have signed. Lucas Burble's is really highly rated. Dragusin, I think he only played 500 minutes after he joined Tottenham in January, but this might sound mad. I know Romania lost 3-0 to the Netherlands mm -hmm. yesterday, but I would argue at least in the first half, he was probably the best player on the pitch. I thought he was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. You'll see a lot more of him next year. So that's the way that their um, transfer department has basically been completely overhauled in the last 12 months. Okay, fantastic. Well, Nancy, I know you've got to leave us. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us with the Leeds perspective as well. I'm sure Leeds fans will be absolutely wounded by this one. But uh, I guess Tottenham, again, a wonderful player. I mean, Jay, you talk about Bergvall. Um, you've actually met him. Um, what do you make of this player? And I guess, do you get a sense of how Spurs are going to utilise this player in the season ahead? Yeah, I think um, Bergvall and Gray are both only 18 and um, they're going to be such exciting talents. And that's the thing with Tottenham. When you throw um, Pape Matassar into the mix as well, you've got, as I think Sars 21, you've got three midfielders there who could form the spine of your midfield for the next five to 10 years. But yeah, I flew over to um, Stockholm in May to meet Lucas Bergvall. He plays for Jure Gardens and in January, Tottenham signed in on his 18th birthday. Actually, I think he joined on February the 1st or February the 2nd. And that was another deal that was a little bit manic, but 
that wasn't really on Tottenham's um, part. Um, Bergvall was really heavily interested by Barcelona and he went to go and meet Deco, who's Barcelona's sporting director over in Barcelona. And he was basically mobbed when he was with Deco in a restaurant. Um, they ended up, you know, trying to drive away from all these people and all the paparazzi. And they ended up switching cars in a garage. It basically sounded like something from a, a, a gangster film or a thriller film or something like that. Um, it was really interesting. Um, but throughout, when I met Bergwell, he said, even from the beginning, I felt like Tottenham was the, the right place for me. I was really impressed by their, their pitch and their presentation. Um, and I decided that that would be the better place for my development. And I got to watch him um, play in a game. And I think what stood out immediately is that at 18 years old, and he was playing as a 10 in that game, but he was dropping deep to the edge of the box loads to receive the ball, very confident driving forwards. Um, and I think there were multiple times where he kind of told teammates who were probably 5, 10, maybe even 15 years older than him, no, give me the ball, do this, do that. And that always, to me, really stands out. Um, great leadership. And it's very interesting that when I interviewed one of his coaches um, and asked about Lucas, he said, everybody in Sweden's known about Lucas since he was about 10 years old. Everybody's referred to him as the next big Swedish talent. So there's been a lot of pressure on his shoulders. He's won a lot of tournaments at a young age. Um, there was a competition that his um, academy team, Roma Porky and I played in, I think um, six or so years ago. And I think they beat PSG and Bayern Munich and then ended up winning the final. And um, he was voted the best player of the competition. So there's been all this hype around him. And so the fact that he's got to a point where he is now Sweden international, he's played for them in a friendly, he's got um, top flight experience in the Swedish league and he's now moved to Tottenham. I think all of the ingredients are there for a very, very exciting player. But with Graham Bergvall, we all need to be patient. We need to give them the time to make mistakes and to hopefully fulfil their potential. We can't expect too much of them too quickly. Yeah, there's two things I want to follow on on that, really, um, is that, you know, uh, you talk about these incredible achievements pre-coming to the Premier League and Gray as well in, in many respects. His season at Leeds sounded like a fantastic one, but inevitably for these young men to push on, they need to play football. And, you know, I can understand the allure of the Premier League, especially a team like Tottenham, but do we think they'll get enough time on the pitch? Or, as you said, is it just a patience thing? I think... Um... When I spoke to, to Lucas's parents, and uh, this is all in the, the piece I wrote on The Athletic, they described it as a five-year project. Um, and they said, we're aware of the fact that Lucas might hit the ground running and we might not need to, to, to worry about his adaptation to the Premier League, but he might need a year. He might need two years. There are lots of players older than Bergvall and Gray who need time to adapt to the Premier League. So we need to remind ourselves of that. And the same with Gray, you know, Nancy alluded to it. What a mad 48 hours to put somebody who's 18 through over the weekend. He needs time to, to breathe and catch his breath and process the fact that he's leaving his family behind. He's going to move to London for the first time. Uh, well, well, he's going to move to London and away from home for what I assume is the first time. There's loads of things that they've got to factor into account. Um, when I was talking to, to Bergvall's parents, Bergvall's two younger brothers both play football. So they're going to remain at home in Sweden while Bergvall moves to London. So there's so many behind the scenes dynamics that we always need to factor into account. But in terms of playing time, like I said, they've got the Europa League this season. They've got the cup competitions. I think one thing which slightly limited Postacoglu's ability to play youngsters last season was that they got knocked out of the Carabao Cup and the mm. FA Cup. So that's a good place on. to test them out, isn't it? Yeah, Quite early on. And also, Postacoglu's first season at Tottenham was just about making sure that his core starting 11, 14, 15 players could play in the style that he wanted. That's, that, that was the most important thing. Of course, developing young talent is key. Mm. But the most important thing was that the players he was using week in, week out knew what he wanted. And I think he's got the vast majority of them up to that point. So now mm. he can start to think about where can I flesh out the rest of this squad? What are the tiny tweaks that I need to make? Who's the pl person that's going to improve us in midfield? Or who's the person that's going to improve us in attack? Who are the youngsters coming through who I can now push and play a little bit more and and I guess risk playing them in, in high profile games a little bit more. So I'd be very surprised if we didn't see Bergval, Gray and Mikey Moore, who's, you know, an incredible player as well and, and a really big talent that lots of people rate. I'd be really surprised if we didn't see more of them next season. Yeah, I mean, the, the pressures of the Premier League 
especially for a team like Tottenham who are pushing for a new frontier is the need to win something um, and it's not easy <laughs> especially even with the team that you might have in Ange Postacoglu do you think you'll have enough time then to, to be able to really bed these players in if Tottenham don't get the results that are required for us to see progress under him I, th- I think he'll be given time. Like I said, I think the end of last season and especially the hype around that um, Man City game has slightly just skewed our perceptions of what Postacoglu did in his first season. Um, Tottenham had finished, I think it was eighth um, in the season before. Um, they sold Harry Kane and I'm pretty certain if you'd offered Tottenham fans to finish seventh or sixth, they would have bitten your hand off for it. What they all wanted was to reconnect with the club. I was actually there on the final day of the um, their final home game of the 2022-23 season. They lost 3-2 to Brentford and Brentford came from behind to win that game. And Kane was basically waving goodbye. And I'm pretty certain there were boos all around the ground. I was also at their final home game of this season. Tell a lie, I wasn't. I was at their, the second to last home game, which was against Burnley on a Saturday. The final home game was the Man City game on a weekday. So they treated the Burnley game the final home game of the season, did a lap of appreciation, etc. And everyone was getting clapped. Um, there was a real feeling that it was the, the start of a really exciting journey. And yes, you know, even if Tottenham start the next season badly, I still think Ange Postacoglu has enough goodwill in the bank from the club, the players, the supporters, for people to, to trust what he's trying to do. Like I said, Spurs fans were so bored of the slightly anemic football they were playing under Conte and Mourinho and and Nuno. Um, Having Ange come in and play in a really exciting way and, you know, to give these quite um, funny sound bites in press conferences, I think they just warned to him so quickly, you know, they were singing I'm loving Big Ange instead to Robbie Williams' Angels. It just feels like he united the club in a way that we hadn't seen since maybe the middle of Pochettino's reign. And so I think... um, He'll be given that time. But of course, results are important. I think there's probably a question mark over other areas of the squad. I know some of the fans want to see a a proper defensive midfielder. Um, You know, Richarlison's had his struggles on and off the pitch over the last year. And there's a suggestion that, you know, he's got a lot of interest from the Saudi Pro League. So will he stay around? So there's a few things that need to be be looked at. Um, But I still think there's loads of things in place there for them to be a success going forward. Yeah, you're spot on there. And, you know, I know Timo Werner's also re-signed uh, on loan for, for another season. Anyone bubbling under the lips of, you know, the, the, the transfers that potentially could be coming to Spurs again? Because, I mean, they're, they're looking quite stacked, especially in the young department anyway. Yeah, and I think they're looking um, pretty stacked up wide as well. You know, we've got Werner, Johnson, uh, Mano Solomon, once he's fully recovered from his injury, um, Hung Min Son, um, Kulisevsky. So certainly in an attacking positions out wide, they look good. As I just alluded to, I think the, the big question mark for them is, is Richarlison going to be the striker who's going to get them 20 goals mm. a season and, and fires them into the top four mm. and, and hopefully in the in the nearer, fu- nearer future? I think that's yeah. it. Yeah. I, I get what um, you're saying. I get what you're saying. <laughs> in the near future. Um, in the near future, um, fires them to be in a title race. And I think there's still yeah. question marks over whether he is that player. Um, and like I said, do they sell him to the Saudi Pro League if he wants to go and try and upgrade in that position. But then we all know there's not that many high quality number nines out there and the demand for them is very high. Um, I've also mentioned Colin Gallagher at the, at the top of this. Um, so I think the spine of that starting eleven is really talented. Van der Ven and Romero, probably one of the best centre-back partnerships in the league. You know, James Madison had a disappointing second half of the season, but his first half of the season was really impressive. Son is always going to get you goals. So I think it's only a few small tweaks that need to be made for them to kind of take the next step in their development. Okay, fantastic. Jay, thanks you so much for joining us. And also Nancy, who had to leave us earlier. Really appreciate your time as well. Look, plenty of other podcasts to listen to across the Athletic Network. You can also go to the Totally Football Show for reactions to all of the games at the Euros and our daily football briefing show for a bite-sized wrap-up in the morning. We'll also be back tomorrow for a deep dive into one of the day's biggest stories. As always, thank you so much for listening. If you want to watch more episodes of the show, please subscribe to the channel. We'll be joined by the likes of David Ornstein, Matt Slater, Adam Crafton, Karl Anker, and plenty more through the season. If you'd like to listen to the episodes in full in audio form, search The Athletic FC wherever you get your podcasts from.